as you said, the interview, the story, the individual who had the experience describing it. And you could hear in their voice that, that they are, there's no talking them out of what they experienced. You can't take an experience away from somebody. They, whatever they thought happened is what they think happened. And so it was just so fascinating. And when I moved here to Seattle, I'm originally from Montreal. I moved here in 2000, uh, and there was a paranormal conference going on. I thought, how interesting. Right here in my own – I just moved here, and they're already having conferences that I like. And uh, I attended, joined the group. And participated. I was the technical director for that group for two years. And then uh, we started our own group just because of uh, the process, procedure, and protocol that we wanted to put in place was maybe a bit too rigid for some groups. Uh, but that's where we wanted to take it. And so the only way to do that was to start on our own group, which we did. Yes, and apparently very successfully, judging by the numbers of people that I saw and, and what I was hearing around me when I was there. Yes, well, James, it was you. Uh-oh. You threw people into the group. Ah. Yeah, our meetings are very well attended. Uh, we have a very well-rounded membership from all facets of life. When I look around at the membership that Whisper has, it's, they're such wonderful people. It, it's like family, but you got to pick them. And they're from, they would never have met if it wasn't through Whisper just because what they all did in life individually would never have crossed paths with what the other members were doing. So it, it's really nice to see this this crossing of different views culturally, politically, um, socially. It's just very, very fascinating. That's right at the heart. I, I love to hear you say that because that is so right at the heart of what I see happening in Epic because we're trying to reach out to everyone who has a heart who believes that there's something more to this whole universe. And so we didn't want to be rigidly a classic, you know, we only do nuts and bolts, uh, flying saucers with little gray men. We wanted to be able to explore the phenomena in all of its aspects and even beyond that to all the other types of phenomena that are being reported by people everywhere, you know, such as that whole huge spectrum that you're covering. Exactly, and and we've gone on Bigfoot expeditions. Uh, we just did that uh, at the end of this summer. So it's not just the spirit side, although there's more people who are having that type of experience. I guess the fortunate thing is with with the paranormal, with hauntings, is it's at a physical location, and typically it repeats itself. So the chances of a paranormal group experiencing something is far greater than UFOlogy and a sighting is usually – it's not a repeat sighting. It just happened once, and so it's so hard to duplicate. You can't, like, prepare to watch. No, I, I agree with you, and that's one, of the, that's one of the greatest difficulties of this phenomenon is that, you know, it's so ephemeral most of the time. You've got one experience, and you've got to, you know, get, ring every last bit of information out of it and hope that it takes you somewhere or that it's part of a bigger pattern. <laughs> yes. But met some very interesting people, uh, including other groups. It's so fascinating to meet up with other groups and through their experiences, what uh, philosophies they've gathered, which beliefs they support or don't support. It's just fascinating. No, I can I can remember that when I first became a police officer down in in Aberdeen that I met a deputy sheriff who was extremely serious about Bigfoot. And then I found out that they had been collecting things that had been reported to the sheriff's office over the years. And a friend of mine swore up and down. He went to this deputy's house, and the deputy had a trunk, and he also had hunting dogs. And in this trunk, he had branches that had supposedly been broken off by a Bigfoot creature. And if he would open the trunk and take these branches out of the bags that he had them in, the dogs would go crazy and run away and hide. Oh, wow. And it was consistent. You know, I mean, you could, if you opened the branch, took the branches out, the dogs were gone. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, it- what do you do with that? How do you explain it? I mean, uh, other than the obvious, they're, it kind of, that you go with what you were told and see where it leads. Yep, and I would go with, there's definitely something that the dogs don't like about those branches. Maybe they were beaten as pups with that type of wood. 
Oh, oh, you're good. Okay, that's the detective in you. Excellent. Yeah, I would want to know where the branches were and if there was something else behind that. If I took a branch of the same type of tree in a different location, would they react the same? Yes, and that's the sort of investigative testing that you have to do yep. because you want to make sure that when you – if you do – I guess one of the things you mentioned earlier too I, I just bring out is what we're doing a lot of the time is an exclusionary diagnosis. Yep. Oh, here, I have an interesting question for you. Do you feel there is a common thread between UFO sightings and spiritual experiences? And I would say in in the cases we've done, we've never had the two. But there's the, the famous story of the Skinwalker Ranch that to me just – it just kind of crosses all the barriers. The only thing it doesn't have, I believe, is the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, but it's it's got the sightings of greys. Uh, the time travel or displacement where people are seeing uh, tears in the in the air, I guess. And on the other side of the tear, they will see like a sunny day or nighttime or different weather. Uh, they've seen uh, humanoid type things like Bigfoot going through it and then disappearing, uh, apportation, uh, ghost-like hearing voices, uh, things moving. Uh, that, I think that the Skinwalker Ranch, if you Google that, you'll find all kinds of stories on that. Uh, I think that does cross it. So, yeah, I I would say that there is I, – I don't know if – I don't think all cases are you know the same thing, but I do believe that a lot of the phenomenon that occurs between the two are similar. I hesitate. I call it dotted line conclusion and a solid line conclusion. It's a dotted line conclusion. Based on what I know so far, they seem to be associated in some way, but I'd hate to draw the line between them as saying it, it definitely is. Sure. If, if that makes sense. No, I think it absolutely does. And I just thought of one more example. Uh, as I recall, John Keel wrote the book, The Mothman Prophecies. Mm. They, they based a movie on that with uh, Kevin Costner, as I recall. And what is not brought out in the movie that is brought out in the book is that he originally went there because of a series of UFO sightings. But when he got there and started interviewing people, there was something much stranger going on, which was the sighting of this this really odd being. And then, of course, it kind of all culminated in that horrible destruction where the bridge fell into the river with all the cars on it, which is you know, vividly depicted in the movie, but which really happened. Yes. And one wonders, was it a prophecy of or an omen of things to come? Was it whatever they did had actually caused structural weakness in the bridge? Like, was it cause or effect? Exactly. Here's another interesting question. I'm sure you must have people in your group who have uh, analytical or scientific technical careers. And the question is, do they feel conflicted over whether or not to discuss paranormal experiences with their colleagues? Absolutely. You have to consider that this is such a polarizing subject that depending on the field of research that you're in, this is a career killer. If you were studying uh, quant well, maybe quantum physics, you'd get away with it. Uh, but if you're in the sciences and you come up with this theory that, that you're able to communicate to people that are dead, that's too big a stretch. And you either be, you know, a coffee room topic of, that's interesting. Tell me more about it as they, you know, looking up a list of doctors to prescribe to you. Uh, or just outright, I can no longer take you seriously. And it's sad because shouldn't science be open-minded to the possibility? Now, open-minded to the possibility, not just openly accept everything as being true. Uh, I like to call it – you have to have a healthy skepticism. When we go into a house, it's not because it is haunted or it's not because it's not haunted. We go in and based on what we experience, determine one direction or the other. But to go in with a with a presumption of what's going on before you even enter the house – you're doomed. You have to go in with the open mind of, I'm willing to follow the evidence regardless of the conclusion. That is totally awesome. What you just re related is right at the heart of any investigative training that I certainly could offer anybody, is that you, you cannot get ahead of the evidence. You have to let the evidence speak to you. 
the I was just also thinking of the uh, tragic situation. Another great example is what's faced by airline pilots. If an airline pilot reports a UFO in the United States, it could definitely be a career killer. An airline pilot in Great Britain can report a UFO, and they just accept it as a report. Exactly. Two different countries. And we have – no, let, wait, let me do this the politically correct way. If we had pilots in our group, they possibly have said the same thing to us. Uh huh. Here's a uh, fascinating question. Have you ever encountered an extremely malevolent entity in the course of your investigations? And how did you handle that? It's, I would say that several times we've gone into a case that it was thought to be a malevolent entity in the home. Now, again... That's the interpretation of the people living there for whatever reason, how they arrive at that conclusion. Uh, usually it, it's, there's some religious belief that's supporting their uh, feelings as to why it's demonic. Uh, so when we go in there, we always take precautions. It, it, we're open to the possibility that this exists. To say it doesn't exist is, is you know, it's not very intelligent of us to just start dismissing things out of hand. So we will go in and we will have basically a, a circle where we, before we go in, we say, okay, we are here to help the family that's here. We kind of introduce ourselves to the spirit. If they're sentient, then they know what we're doing. And we've introduced ourselves and we're being polite and respectful. If they're not, then we've made all our team feel better that they're going in as a group. And they've made their intent known to the group members, if no one else. And uh, so when we think it is something like that, we, we never go in alone. There's always two people all the time going everywhere. So if something were to happen, we have a witness. And if something was to happen, then we have help. Uh, but it's never turned out to be malevolent in the end. It seems to be – again, I don't have like a little bottle of, of the spirits we've removed, uh, but we have what the psychics have picked up either before, after, or during. And what seems to be just people who have passed on that were just nasty in life, uh, the guy who was like the, the pedophile or, or, the, or the rapist or the, someone who just uh, beat his wife. Uh, and so that, that negativity of that person – if you're you know, a, a normal everyday person and you're around somebody like that, in real life, they wouldn't be people you'd hang around with and they'd be considered evil. And so in their passing, they seem to maintain a lot of that characteristic. And so the feeling that they give off is that negativity. Uh, and that's what we've seen. So at the end, we've gone in with the holy water and we'll use the uh, shamanic uh, religions for cleansing, a Wiccan, a Catholic um, a Native American, and and we'll just kind of do a little bit of everything because I think it's kind of disrespectful to think that all spirits will respond to the cross or to uh, you know prayer rocks or uh, to think that one one means of cleansing is more powerful than the other. So we just use a little bit of of all of our beliefs and go through. Most importantly, though, it's, we empower the homeowners to try to do the same thing uh, with their beliefs. Because it's the, the energy that you're interacting with, you have energy as well. And so you should be able to interact with that to counter it. As that negative energy is residing in your basement, you should be able to infuse it with positive energy. Uh, so, yes, we go in with, with the feelings that there's something demonic. And in the end, it's turned out to be just a, just a crabby-ass person. <laughs> and you send them back to the universe with a blessing and hope that they do better next time. That some of some of the people in the group feel that it is kind of like a uh, the Indian reincarnation thing. You keep on coming back to get it right. That you live your life to learn the lessons that you didn't learn in your previous life, and you keep on going through it until you get it right. It's unfinished business. Here's a question: What is the most unusual case you have been on that left you more confused than you were before going into the investigation? When we leave a case that leaves us confused, it's usually the homeowners. It's usually the family doesn't want to accept what we've told them. And that's the part. It's, it's kind of like there's nothing that we could have done differently. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that we could have done that would have satisfied what their expectations were. 
So there are some cases that we won't take because the expectations of the client are such that we know we cannot help them. What would be an unrealistic expectation? Uh, one case, uh, a gentleman was sensitive to energies. Whether these were uh, energies of those that had passed on or not, or, or hydroelectric poles, I don't know. But one of our psychics was able to pick up where there was like a, a, a an energy, a radiant energy that she could sense. And it just happened to be where this gentleman would sleep. And his his feeling was that something was attacking him at night. He could feel this, like, uh, not fire ants, but he could feel things on his leg, like a, an energy. And so we had him, you know, he was dressed in his, his pajamas, and he laid in bed, and we had video cameras. We had a laser, uh, a laser sensor on the bed to detect if there was motion other than what he was causing. We had it, like, reflect off of a mirror so we could see any slight motions. And every time he felt this energy... The psychic that was nearby also sensed the energy was there. And when he wasn't there, she could sense the energy. So we knew it wasn't him radiating. And so he was sensitive to energy. But he insisted that we could do something to get rid of it. And it was like, we can't. It, it's, it's like a, it's like a geo, geomagnetic energy that's just here. Uh, you know, and maybe if we got heavy, Equi- Earth-moving equipment, we could change some of the structure of the ground and make the pattern like less strong there. But it was one of these, you know, we, we can't change this. You have to accept the fact that you have a sensitivity, just like an allergy. I can't make you not allergic or can't make you stop reacting to energies around you. And that was one of those cases where it, it was almost to the point of abuse to us to resolve his problem. It's like we want to help you, and we did. We've identified that you're... You're allergic to energies. Well, we can't make them go away. Uh, yeah, it, it's if they're sentient beings that uh, you can no longer, you can no more tell a person to, you know, stop looking at me, you know, stop doing that. Like like to a brother and a sister fighting, you can't make them stop. You can yell, and scream, and wave your arms around, and uh, but in the end, it's it's almost the acceptance uh, of the spirit to to stop, to move on, because whatever he was doing it for. It's okay. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, funny enough, judgment. If your religious belief is that you know you're going to go to heaven if you're good, but what constitutes bad? So when you're judged, what are the things that you've done in your life that you think would be hell worthy? So if you consider a young adult or a child uh, not eating your green vegetables when your mom said you better eat all your green vegetables, Jimmy, or you're going to go to hell. It may sound dramatic, but is it really? Maybe some parents have told their kids something like that. You know, if you don't treat your brother nice, you're going to go to hell. You're not going to go to heaven. And so little Jimmy has a horrible accident, and he finds himself in between worlds. And well, I didn't eat my green vegetables, and I did poke my brother in the in the in the ear with my pencil. I don't want to go to hell. I'm not going to be judged. I'm just going to stay right here. And so you've got confused spirits that don't want to move on because they're afraid they're going to be judged and don't want to, you know, uh, quote-unquote, go into that light or move on or leave this plane. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, spirits like that. Some are just mean, nasty people who just don't want to because they're causing misery and they take delight in that. Uh, so uh, a lot of what we do is once we're down to the, it seems to be spirits that are just miserable, yeah, I call it the spirit counseling. Whichever psychic feels they can communicate or hear them respond to questions other people are asking, we kind of see, you know, you, know, you won't be judged that you know, uh, an all-loving God will, will accept you despite your transgressions and it's part of your growing. And, you know, uh, and in some cases, you know, the next day when we've left, the family has, you know, everything's okay now, everything's stopped. Sometimes it's being able to identify that we think it's this, and then the homeowner says, you know what, that sounds like Uncle Bernie, uh, that, that kidder. And then the activity is not scary. It's, it's Uncle Bernie. It, so it takes away the, the fear element. So when it happens, it's not as dramatic as when it was Satan. You know, that is so profound. I was thinking of, uh, once again, I was comparing it to experiences that my wife has related to me with her hospice mm-hmm. uh, cases. And she's told me how important it is for the loved ones, for the family around the person who's trying to pass over to say, 
you know, we really love you and we wish you could stay, but we know that if you, it, it's time to go, then, then we're okay with that. You know, we, we're going to let you go and, and, and we understand. And then the person passes peacefully because it's no longer this, oh, I can't go because I'm going to inflict all this pain on all the people that love me. And instead they're told it's all right if you pass over and they do. Exactly. There's a lot of that. A crisis apparition is what it's called most commonly. When someone dies and the people that weren't at their bedside, who weren't there at their passing, will see that person. How many times have you heard someone say, I got a phone call and I answered it and it was Uncle Jimmy and I found out the next day I found out Uncle Jimmy had died then. And he just called to say everything was okay. Or I saw my father or a, a loved one and they see them or people just know something happened to dad. Dad died, and then the phone rings, and they find out that he was. It's almost like that crisis apparition where people see the person that's dying because they want them to know that they're okay. And those usually don't reoccur. It's crisis. It's at the time of that event, and then they just move on. And then the other ones where we've heard of people who are so grief-stricken by the passing that they don't want to let go. As you just mentioned, they don't tell that loved one, you go on. So the spirit's trapped here because they're they're bound by the love of this person who's still alive, who just feels that they can't go on without them. So they wait. Wow. Here's a a question. Do you, uh, whenever you have one of these assignments, do you make this public? And if so, do you have your findings? Re- it's this is a protocol that requires a third party to review what you've collected from one of your uh, investigations. The third party review is something that's always been uh, interesting. You want to have the third party review. Yeah, my my daytime job is is doing uh, validation and testing of of, of cell phones of, of cellular telephony, three G radios, GSM phones, and it's. For someone to do the testing of that, they have to be certified to do the testing. They have to be knowledgeable enough that they can ascertain whether the people that are doing the testing are qualified and the results they've obtained are, in fact, accurate. So who's a trusted third party to do this evaluation other than other groups? There's no real certification by it. That was always the challenge of how do we make sure that groups out there are doing things right, that they're not adding to um, – incorrect data. If we were to collect the data of all the groups, how do we weigh which group's data is more meaningful than others because it was obtained properly? So that's the thing that was missing. So for peer review, uh, Whisper does not present its findings online. And the reason for that is it's about helping people. And the majority of time, the people, we don't wear whisper clothing on some investigations. We don't drive in a big truck saying ghost hunters, uh, flashing ambulance sirens. We go as low-key as possible because if you lived in a building and a big ghost lab pulled up in front of your house and you were selling it shortly afterwards, you don't want to lose the value of your house, people thinking it's haunted or that you were not of sound mind if the people judging you would think that way. So we have to be very, very discreet. So we stopped trying to post evidence online because it was like a game to see who could show you a picture of a ghost. If the evidence is too good, people believe you created it. And if it's not good enough, then people won't believe it. So we were stuck in this this uh, middle earth of uh, there's nothing I can show you that would convince you. So what's the point? Why? Why try to present this? So it's it's more of just gathering the data of uh, does the solar cycle have anything to do with the intensity of paranormal phenomenon? And it's something that because groups only do an investigation, the most we could do is an investigation a weekend. So that's 52 investigations in a year. I can't do it every single weekend. So cut that in half, 26, say 30. 30 investigations isn't enough to get real good statistics. So sure. at this point, it's still gathering. And I wish there were more groups where we could say the way they capture data is something that I would accept their data into my, my pool. And so it's something that I wish that they had the capability of doing. But in my uh, my six, well, eight years now of, of playing in the paranormal field, there isn't that 
almighty body because there's there's no one gets paid and it would cost money to put a program together where you could say okay you are truly uh, able to judge or or review or uh, certified to use a piece of equipment so we're talking about professional qualifications for paranormal investigators yes basically okay because right well, now you, cause you could be little jimmy you just watch scooby-doo and if you're good at websites you can have a great website up tomorrow and you look just as qualified as as a scientist who's been doing this for 30 years but isn't good at websites that's certainly a great point the uh do you have any final comments or thoughts that you want to bring up um if you're getting into this to experience paranormal phenomenon uh do it in public places don't involve families in your quest for fun and if you're doing this to help people then we feel that the spirits know of your intention of what you're doing and you'll have great success in doing so that seems like a, a really excellent conclusion and I really want to thank you, Darren, because you've given me a lot of insights into what you do that I didn't have, and I think that we've all been treated to hearing about rigorous investigative technique, which I am totally in favor of, and yet your heart is in the right place. So I want to extend my sincere thanks to you and to Whisper for being there. My pleasure. Uh, it, the, the satisfaction of being able to help somebody, uh, that's what it's all about. Well, most excellent. And with that, I just want to announce to everyone that this has been an Inception Radio broadcast brought to you by EPIC, the Extraordinary Phenomena Investigations Council. I'd like to invite everyone to listen again to this broadcast next week by EPIC. When Jim Mars, a very famous author, will be discussing the famous UFO flyover of Washington, D.C. in 1952 with two witnesses. And I can tell you that I don't want to miss that. And this is a very important case. And with that, I bid you all good night and wish you luck on your explorations into the worlds beyond. Goodbye. Thank you for being with us tonight. Please join us again next Monday evening for Extraordinary Phenomena Investigations Council's Epic Voyages. I'm Roger Peacock for Epic. Until next time. You say 